obedience. Our neural mechanisms illuminate responses to authority figures. Emily Casper, Ghent University. On November the 9th, 1989, I was a two-year-old toddler, probably at kindergarten or with my grandmother. I would like to start this presentation by a quote from Howard Zinn that is truly inspirational but also represents a very dark reality. He stated that historically the most terrible things that happen, war, genocides and slavery, have resulted not from disobedience but from obedience. And actually, when you look at the history of mankind, you see that many perpetrators, they use the justification of just following orders to explain the atrocities they commit. One of the most famous examples are the, the Nazi officers during the Nuremberg trials who claimed that they were just following orders. But actually, I have also interviewed former genocide perpetrators in Rwanda, notably. I have interviewed more than 50 of them, and the huge majority of them report that they just followed orders. So it's interesting already here, because we have two different cultures, two different historical events, and yet the perpetrators, they report the same justification to explain how they participate or why they participated in the genocide. But of course, in the case of the Nuremberg trials or the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda, an argument has been raised that perhaps because they were, there was a trial, because they had a risk of being prosecuted, they could have used this justification to reduce a bit the responsibility. But then I have also interviewed former Khmer Rouge members in Cambodia to ask why they did participate. And here, all of them report that the reason for participation is obedience to authority. But what is special with Cambodia is that none of them has been trialed, none of them will ever risk jail for what happened. And yet, they use the exact same justification. So here is for me a very interesting question. Why so many human beings on different continents, in different eras, use the exact same justification to explain the atrocities they commit? So today, to break the walls of blind obedience, first, we are going to look at what is happening in the brain when we follow orders that can perhaps explain that our morality can be blurred. And second, I will also show you some results of studies that I've done where I did compare directly former genocide perpetrators and rescuers to try to understand why in a similar environment you have some people who choose the path of hateful propaganda and violence and others who choose the other path. So to understand what is happening in the brain when we follow orders, I did a lot of studies using neuroimaging methods and electrophysiography. So that's really to measure the brain activity. And so I had an experimental paradigm where I invited two real participants, and one was assigned to be an agent, and the other one was assigned to be a victim. And agents here, they had to face a moral decision. Either they were pressing a button that would send a mildly painful relaxing shock to the person in front of them, but they would earn five cents in exchange, or they would press the other button where they would not send a shock, but they would not increase their own monetary gain. So this was to, to really have them facing a moral decision. And to understand what is happening in the brain in that situation, we contrast two types of experimental conditions. One in which they are entirely free to decide what to do. We tell them, OK, you have 60 trials, 60 times you can make the decision to send the real shock to the person in front of you or not. And in the other one, the experimenter gives them orders to send the shock or not to the person. I must say, as a side joke, um, when I actually designed this task, I was at University College London, and I really thought that no one would ever administer a real shock to the person in front of them for five cents. <laughs> and it has been weeks of tremendous debates with my colleagues there. 
And so we, we did start the task, and actually, in the first study we did, and also in the following ones, people administer an average like 32, 34 shocks out of 60 to the person in front of them. So they earn like, what, 1 euro 70? <laughs> so I must say, and I w must warn you, I'm a behavioral neuroscientist, but apparently I'm quite bad at predicting people's behavior. But yeah, beyond that, <laughs> Here is what happened in the brain. So as I said, we have used a lot of methods, neuroimaging method, also EEG, to see what changes occur when we obey orders compared to when they are acting freely. And actually, we have seen that obeying orders impacts a lot of different processes in the brain. For instance, it impacts the sense of agency, so the sense that you are the, feeling, the, the author of your own action. It impacts empathy, for the pain that you inflict to the victim, it impacts your feeling of guilt, your feeling of responsibility, and also moral conflict when you make the decision. But here, it's not only what they report explicitly, that's what the brain shows. So here, it, for instance, uh, this is an MRI study where we looked at brain activations in empathy-related brain regions when they were witnessing the shock being delivered on the victim. So as a reminder here, the shocks was exa were exactly the same when people were free to decide or were obeying orders. And yet, their brain, you can see that on the uh, light green bars, their brain uses less information, there was less activity in empathy-related brain regions when they were obeying orders compared to when they were acting freely. So that really shows that obedience impacts the brain in a lot of ways. And here, for instance, you do not process the pain that you inflict to others in the same way that you would do if you were free to decide. There is a side note I would like to make. So I have, as mentioned, interviewed a lot of former genocide perpetrators in different countries. Because for me, yes, there is an important question, which is to understand why they did participate. But there is an equally important question, which is how they could have stopped. The history of nations have shown us that genocides, wars, almost never end, but ends on their own. It's most of the time because external entities intervened that such atrocities are stopped. So I wanted to know from those people, those people who were in this killing state of mind, how they could have stopped participating. And the majority of them, be it in Rwanda or in Cambodia, they reported that they would nev never have stopped without an external intervention. One of them, for instance, even reported to me I would have never stopped, and I would have motivated my children to do the same. So I think it's very crucial to consider more research dedicated on how humans can stop being in this killing state mode when there are hateful propagandas. But it also shows the responsibility of the international community to intervene when there is an ongoing atrocities. Another line of research that I'm trying to do to understand these questions is to really compare former genocide perpetrators and rescuers, because here we have people who, despite the very similar context, chose two very different paths. So, during the coffee break, uh, there was a small uh, poll that was available that some of you uh, completed. I think close has the poll, yes. And so, you were requested to imagine being in a society where a group is blamed for all the economic and political insecurity of the country. And people, you were asked to decide if you would act as rather a perpetrator or as a rescuer. Actually, the result, should I, I let you guess what the results are? Probably not. Why it is for rescuers. So you see that there is a huge discrepancy. Um, yeah, here it what it with uh, results in a, in a graph. But what are the actual numbers? Of course, it's very difficult to have actual numbers because I mean, most of the time we don't know how many people took part in a genocide, many rescuers died because of their rescue action. But you can clearly see that the number of perpetrators or rescuers inside the population, be it under the Nazi occupation or in Rwanda, is I would dare to say totally the opposite of what we see here. So I think it's very interesting to also have self-reflection about this. And of course, I do not mean that all be whole behaviors in a genocide can be just explained by these two sides. Of course, it's more complex, it depends on the context, but still that's very interest to see, interesting to see the discrepancy between 
what we observe or what, what, how we think we would behave and the real numbers. So in the studies I have done in Rwanda, I contrasted, uh, I compared genocide rescuers, former genocide perpetrators and bystanders, so those who didn't do anything special. And I wanted to show you first this number because I think it really emphasized the importance of studying genocide rescuers. They are largely understudies, they are not well known. But here, for on the 64 rescuers that we interviewed, we asked them, how many people did you help save? And this resulted in more than 900 lives. It's huge. Imagine that just if a tiny more people, a little bit more people, would act as rescuers, the difference it would do regarding the death toll. What, I sure, what I'm sure of is that if more people acted like them, some authoritarian regimes would not have succeeded, and the death toll of human conflicts would be significantly lower. lower. So, in the experiments that we planned, we actually wanted to see how these different populations react to social influence and notably to obedience to authority. And so, this was conducted across the entire Rwanda. We had portative uh, EEGs and we were traveling with it uh, across the country. And uh, in the task, actually, they were receiving orders from an experimenter to take money or not to a victim, which was a research assistant. And so they had two buttons. They could decide what to do, to obey or not. And if they chose to take money from the victim, they could see the face of a research assistant displaying sadness. And we have looked at the brain and how the brain processes these informations. And one of the differences that we have found, actually, is that rescuers, they engage much more neural resources to process the sad emotion of the victim compared to perpetrators or bystanders. It's like if their brain were, processes, were processing much more emotions of distress from uh, victims. And actually, this also correlated with the number of times they decided to resist orders and to say no and to actually re re avoid taking money to the victim. So this may be a first interesting mechanism. But there is another one I would like to mention, which is, I think, uh, crucial. Among the many questions and tests that we, do with them, uh, that we did with them, we also asked them if they had role models in their life. So we asked them, did you witness your parents rescuing or helping people during your childhood? And as you can see here, the results are pretty strong. Rescuers had many more examples of role models in their family than the two other groups. Well, of course, you can see it's not absolute. Human behavior is complex. You can never explain an entire human behavior by a single factor. But I think it's very important because it shows the power of education and the power of having role model to really somehow emulate the same behaviors in the children. And because of these results, I'm now doing another project where I'm trying to develop a book for children and teenagers where I would depict the stories of real-life rescuers. The literature for children, you have a lot of uh, superheroes, but I think it gives a bad impression that you need superpower to do extraordinary actions. And I want to show with the stories of the rescuers that you can just be a very ordinary person but still do things that are amazing. And I'm actually looking for stories from all over the world because I really want the book to depict like the richness of humanity. So here I'm asking you for your help, actually, because that's still work in progress. If you know anyone that would fit in that category, I have many r stories and interviews with rescuers in Rwanda, but as I said, I want stories from everywhere in the world. So if you know someone, if you know NGOs, associations, or whatever, who are working uh, with these populations, please contact me, because I think, as I mentioned, that these studies are very crucial. We have a lot, of, uh, lot to learn from the rescuers for peace. So I think that together, uh, we can break the walls of blind obedience. Thank you.